Hey everyone, this is George Kroos with a solo episode of the Innovators Mindset podcast. And thank you so much for being here, for listening, for watching, wherever you are. Uh, one of the things I'm really trying to do is to, I know this sounds weird because I'm talking to you on YouTube or you're listening to me on some audio, is I'm really trying to, res I don't know, say restrict, but be more cognizant of the time that I am spending utilizing technology and how I connect with people, how I share with people. And I think one of the reasons why is I'm reading this book, which is kind of fascinating because I'm reading it on Kindle <laughs> on my phone, mostly. Uh, it's called Digital Minimal Minimalism uh, by Cal Newport. And it is really kind, it's really kind of thinking about not getting rid of technology, not, but being thoughtful of what your principles are and what you're trying to do, and then aligning how you use technology with that. So I, for me, one of the things that I really try to focus on um, is the idea of, do I use this to create human connection? Do I use this to further my own learning? Do I use this to actually create curiosity? Um, I'll, I'll give you a quick synopsis, and it's not solely what I'm talking about, but there's a reason why I'm sharing this. Um, it, it's the, the uh, definition of digital minimalism is this. A philosophy of technology use in which you focus your online time on a small number of carefully selected and optimized activities that strongly support things you value and then happily miss out on everything else. And I, I thought about this quite a bit. And I've been reading this book, um, Jonathan Haidt's book, Anxious Generation. And I'm really not in the camp of banning stuff. I'm just not. Uh, I feel this is part of our world. This is reality. And the best thing we can do is not pretend it doesn't exist and hope for the best of their kids, but really teach them how to be thoughtful in the way that you, they use it. So the best way you can teach them is through your actions and your, how you're modeling things. So um, why I'm bringing this up is because maybe you're listening to this to further your own thinking. I listen to podcasts as a way to really kind of develop my knowledge. I don't think it's all about creation. I think it's about um, meaningful consumption and then what do we create with this? So as you're listening to this, and I've said this a million times, but you know, how often do people take me up on this? I hope that you can maybe get some thoughts from the podcast, some ideas, and then recreate and make your own connections to this and share some of your learning. The things that I'm really trying to focus less on is the mindless scrolling. And it's the, I don't, I don't look at how many views this gets on YouTube, what the audio is, because I think when you get obsessed with that, you focus more on getting the likes and the views than actually um, developing wisdom and you know saying stuff that you want to talk about. And it actually maybe deters you from some of your principles and some of your values. So again, really, and I, and I haven't really synthesized this, but really kind of just generals, general thinking. I'm really trying to create human connection, which I hope, you know, um, sharing some of my thinking, sharing some of who I am and how it connects to what I'm trying to do. Uh, can do that, but really all, honestly develop wisdom. The The thing that I think is really important is, um, it, it is kind of weird. A lot of my friends that knew me probably 15, 20 years ago, I think I'm a lot smarter than I was then, than I am, or maybe I'm a lot smarter now than I was then. And it's because I really kind of immersed myself in using this in meaningful ways. It's the opportunity to connect and reflect and to write blog posts and, you know, do reflections after runs and not worry about likes. I feel like when you're worrying about likes, when you're worrying about content, like just doing stuff because you're trying to, to, uh, get the approval of the algorithm, then you're, you're just a little lost. I, I just, I, it's, I feel it's the wrong thing. One of my things is you really, if you focus on purpose and passion, all of the other stuff that we want in life, the materialistic stuff will probably come to you. But if you focus on the materialistic stuff, that's when we lose purpose and passion. So I just wanted to kind of give that as an opening. That's not even what the podcast is going to be about, but it kind of is a little bit. Um, I actually, my daughter, Clea, she just attended her first basketball camp. And I want to actually talk about three lessons. Uh, I'm very proud of her. Um, this is her first basketball camp. She's probably one of the youngest players at the camp. She's never played basketball in her life. And so um, the thinking was that it was, you know, a great place for her to develop skills, not realizing that there are 17 year olds there. And uh, yeah, there's a bunch of kids with a lot of um, athletic ability, a lot of practice and skills. 
And, you know, Clean and I have shot, we've dribbled, do this thing, but she never played in a game. You know, we've never really done anything really formal. So that's kind of where I thought this would start, but it actually was a little bit more advanced. So I felt it was, um, I was really nervous about it. And you could tell on the very first day, um, she was overwhelmed. She was really struggling because she could tell that kids were um, significantly better skilled than her um, because they had practice, because they had played, they had played in games and stuff like this. And I said to her, you know, it's really important that you look at this um, opportunity as a way to really improve your skills and learn. And do you enjoy playing basketball? She's like, yeah. I said, well, then just enjoy it. Listen to your coach. And uh, and actually, you know, you'll see you'll get better as you go. And I'm very proud. I started crying when this was announced. She won most improved player of the camp. She, She was... I told her this too. She had a long way to go, so she had a lot to improve to do. But it was, but she did it. She was so just amazing uh, in this. And I would probably, you know, I'd pick her up every day, but I wouldn't just pick her up. I would go there, you know, kind of half hour early, just kind of watch, see how she's doing, see what's going on, and really just kind of immerse myself. And I think, you know, it would be really easy to get on your phone and start doing mindless stuff, but this is just something I really wanted to appreciate, really want to be there. And I, you know, a lot of videos, pictures I could have got, I didn't because I just wanted to see what she's, what she, how she's doing. And I was just so proud because um, I know she worked really, really hard. And so there's three things that I learned from watching her at this camp that I think are really important, not only, you know, not only for our kids, but for ourselves. And they're things I look for when I've hired people in the past, um, you know, and what I try uh, to be. So I here's some just kind of quick ideas I want to share with you on this little solo podcast. And I think this is one of the things that we talk about digital minimalism. I want, I've want i written down three points, but I'm just kind of talking them out and see what happens because it, it's a way of sticking to my brain. If I talk it out, share with you, maybe I help someone in the process, but I know definitely I'm helping myself. So um, the first one, I think this is really important, is to be coachable. Uh, I've had people say to me, and I, I do this little question. I ask people, um, you know, about their principle. And I'm very proud of the book, What Makes Good Principle. Check it out in the description down below because uh, I talk about this quite a bit in the book. If, if I hear a teacher say, oh, I love my principle because they let me do <laughs> whatever I want, it's not a good sign. It's not a good sign. It, it, it might actually feel really nice at the beginning, but it's not going to make you better. And imagine like a, a player saying about a coach, oh, I love my coach because my coach just lets me do whatever I want. Well, you know, like that might feel nice. And, you know, Michael Jordan, probably best player of all time in basketball. Um, he, when he had coaches that let him do whatever he wants, he did amazingly well, but never won anything. It was when he actually saw himself as part of a bigger picture. And he actually was pushed and challenged to do things that he wouldn't do without a great coach. That's when he became Michael Jordan, right? There's a lot of people that probably had more skill than Michael Jordan, but they didn't have the work ethic and they weren't willing to be pushed and challenged. And I feel like some of the, the, the strongest people that I've met, no matter what field they're in, they are willing to get challenged and pushed and feedback and they go and seek it out. They go and seek that challenge. And so I told her, I said, when you, when you ask your coach, like everything's yes, coach, right? You just make sure that you're addressing properly, but take that feedback and really try to implement it, you know, as soon as possible. Uh, a lot of times when I would do interviews for teachers on my staff, I would really kind of challenge them and try to give them feedback and see how they receive to it. Because, you know, I wasn't looking for the perfect answer. I was willing, I was looking for people who are willing to grow because I know if you're a really great teacher when you walk into the school, but you're not coachable, people are going to pass you as long if they're willing to grow. But if you're a great teacher and you are coachable, you're like the sky's the limit. And this is true with principles. This is true in life. This is true in relationships. This is true in so many different aspects of who we want to be. If you're in a place where you feel like you know better than everyone, well, eventually everyone's going to pass <laughs> because everyone that's willing to grow anyway. And so I just saw that she was willing to take feedback. Um, I've talked about this story several times as a, a referee. One of the things that really they look for to see how good you would become was during the first half of the game, they would evaluate you. They pull you in at halftime and they would rip you to shreds because they didn't have much time to you know give you positive sandwiches, which are crap or whatever anyways they'd give you like authentic feedback and the expectation was 
that you impl implemented the feedback in the second half. Now you didn't have to, but if you did, that showed something that you were willing to learn. It didn't mean that you always did everything that they said for the rest of your life, but you at least tried it. You see what it would happen. And that's part of it too. And so this is one of the reasons I know uh, Clea did well this week is because she was willing to learn. She was willing and she was very attentive and thoughtful of uh, what her coach said. And she tried. She didn't always, she wasn't always successful, but she always tried to do the feedback. And I think this is just a really great uh, life lesson. The second one, and I picked this up for a coach, and I think this is a, a really important one to me. Um, uh, there was like basically a hustle word. And then one of the things that was said by the coach there, she was talking about how it really meant something to her when she saw kids, like when she'd call them in and they'd run there and they would be first and they'd show up first. And I noticed that right away. And I noticed that um, the kids that were willing to run there and, you know, Again, I know like I talk a lot about basketball, but I feel there's so many lessons that I've learned from basketball that I apply to life, apply to education. Uh, one of the things that Michael Jordan was known for was in practice, he would do everything as hard as possible. He would push first. And because people followed that example, they were willing to do this. But that's part of the reason Michael Jordan was Michael Jordan. He wasn't like really, really amazing and then kind of slacked off. There's, again, so many players that are, you know, aren't willing to do this. And, you know, I... Um, I, I keynote a ton of conference and what a blessing that is. And I'm very proud of that. And I'm, I'm saying that because, um, I also, if I ever get the opportunity, I go and see other speakers at those conferences. I don't sit in the back unless I, I know I got to dip out really early and I don't want to be disruptive, but if I can sit through the whole thing, I sit right up front. I sit up there. I want to learn. I want to connect. I want to get better. I want to learn some ideas, want to share some thinking, and I feel like if I continue to do that, that I'll never face irrelevancy because I'm always having that willingness to grow, getting there first, where a lot of times you see people in education and probably all the other fields, but I, I know education better, so I can't really speak for other fields, is a lot of times we get there early so we can sit as far away as possible. And I don't know what that says when we do that. Uh, I get it sometimes, right? Like, because maybe professional learning sucks. And you're like, well, this, we know this is going to suck, so I'm going to check out. But do you actually take an onus on making professional learning something that works for you? Or do you have an expectation that you better be good or else I'm not going to get anything out of this? And I think when you go into the mindset, and that's something I've been saying for a long time, I haven't had a bad professional learning experience in years because I always take something away from it because I force myself to do that. I show up, I do these things. I actually, uh, weirdly enough, uh, I just took a training to become a spin instructor. And I taught spin for years and years and years in Canada, but I had to get recertified if I wanted to do it in the U.S. And the person who was teaching the class, um, he was great, but I have way more years of experience doing this than he does. But guess what? I sat there and I took in everything. I sat in the front and there's a lot of things I learned because he provided perspectives that I didn't have. He provided techniques and, and experiences and things that I didn't know and so even if you feel that, hey, I am actually, it, like when I, when I hear this, and I'm going to say this is something that drives me bonkers about education, like, oh, you haven't taught long enough, like to give it, really? Really? This is what we're saying? Like imagine a new teacher saying like, hey, you will have to have like X amount of years. No, I'm not saying that, you know, a 10-year teacher knows the same amount as a first-year teacher, but I am saying the first-year teacher has ideas and thoughts that the 10-year teacher might not have and can benefit from. And if you're not looking for that, you're going to, again, you're going to just kind of, kind of fall back. And so I think just kind of being eager, to, I, when I say that the idea be there first, it's the eagerness to learn. It's the eagerness to like put yourself in the front, sharing that too. And do we have that? And um, one of the things I challenge people with, and I've, I've shared this before as well, is that when we do professional learning days, learn in a way that you'd expect from your students. And if our students saw some of the things that were happening in professional learning, um, would we be proud of that? You know, and I, I want to be in that space where I'm constantly asking questions, challenging things, you know, um, asking questions, wanting to know and wanting that curiosity, not asking questions just to have my voice heard, but to actually like learn to take into this. So being there first um, really says something about your willingness to grow, your willingness to continuously push yourself to become better. And you know, there's days where I, let's, I'll be honest with you, like, I'm just not, I'm just not there, but I try to be there as much as possible. I try to be that 
right in that first, that front row, rush into things to because I know that it will help me um, get better. And then um, the last one, and this is kind of, I kind of wrote this down and I'm going to kind of talk it through. I, you know, I said, enjoy it until you don't. So Kalia was having a really, you know, was struggling with the camp because it was really challenging. And so I asked her a couple questions. She didn't really give me a, a straight answer. So I asked her one specific one. I said, do you like basketball more after this week or less? She's like, more. I said, then that's, that's the best sign. Even though it's really challenging and complicated, it can be really, really tough. And so I was okay to actually not have her continue playing basketball after this week. If she had tried, put her best effort in, it just hated it, right? Like there's so many things we can do and she has so many different interests, like whether it's dancing, whether it's music. And so you can't do all things all the time. But I can tell um, a lot of times where I've lost my love for something. I mentioned earlier, the spin instructing. Uh, I loved doing that before and then I kind of got sick of it. And instead of going every day and being sick of it and letting that attitude rub off on people, you know, just because I wanted to continue doing it, it just didn't make any sense. And I think that's true. Like, you know, a lot of times people say, oh, I hate teaching. I'm like, then quit. <laughs> like, you should quit. Like, don't, don't stay there if you don't like it because that's going to that's gonna have an impact. Now, I understand, you know, sometimes we've got to do things we don't like doing. But if we just stay because that's, the, that's our that's our norm that's the thing that we continuously do I don't think that's a good thing and I think it will catch up to you and nobody wants to do something every single day that they hate and so I just think that um, if you if you look at something that you're doing and you're just kind of on autopilot and you hate getting up every day to do that thing it's, it's okay to walk away and try something else try something new and guess what I actually love teaching spin I've taught it a few times this year I love it I have a, a different enthusiasm but it took me about 10 years of being away from it to actually regain that love. Um, walking away from something doesn't mean you'll hate it forever. It just maybe just doesn't fit for you right now. And that's okay. That's okay. Whether it's the profession that you have, whether it's, you know, a hobby that you just kind of are on autopilot, you're doing something like that. And that was a big thing for me was that, you know, being challenged and finding something really difficult doesn't mean you don't like it. But if you just find that you're doing something when it's challenging, but you hate it every single day, then maybe it's time to walk away. And there's, I think a lot of people see that as quitting. I see it as just changing directions. Like don't stay in something you hate. I, I think that's something I've really tried to um, appreciate. I, I always said that I want to actually quit earlier rather than too late. Cause you know, I just, it's really important to me to really kind of be passionate about the things I do. So these are things I picked up from uh, Kalia's basketball camp and seeing her grow and be improved. And I was very, very proud. Um, you know, I think that if you're continuously, she she knows she wasn't the best player there, and that's totally fine. But I'll tell you, if she keeps um, those three tips that she's really kind of followed this week and she exemplified, she'll be doing great. And not I'm not talking basketball. I'm just talking about life. I think, you know, the idea of being coachable, getting there first, and enjoy it until you don't. I think those are things I learned watching her. I was, I was really, really proud. So um, I hope that you got something out of this. But again, if you didn't, I, I know it sounds weird. I did this so I can kind of make my own connections, further my own learning. I think when you take the time to share some ideas, share some thinking, just kind of talk through some stuff. And I, I do this through a podcast. Sometimes I do it through my blog. Sometimes I do it through my email newsletter, whatever. I think there's a power in this. And so uh, I just want to share that all with you. Thanks so much for being here. I hope that you take something from this and make something from this. Don't just take some ideas and just let them go away. But Maybe do a, a video, maybe do a post, maybe sh reshare this on some comment with your insights, when your thoughts, not just a reshare. It's not, it's not about resharing my stuff. I, I honestly, I might not even notice. It's really about what do you do with this? How do you take some of these ideas and how do you go further? I think when we actually look at how we use technology in meaningful ways, it can actually improve things, but if we're just using technology because we're bored, not the best thing. So I um, want to share that idea in digital minimalism with you also something I learned from my daughter. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks for all you do. Take care.